Hey YouTube, how you doing? Thanks for stopping by. This is Matthew with the Counselor's Guild. And today we'll be doing a presentation called You Are What You Do Every Day. And we'll be looking at an article and then I have a follow-up presentation. Uh, so let's start with the article. Okay, the article's from BBC Future uh, from their psychology um, part of their, I guess it's a magazine or just a website. Um, I'll put the link in the description if you have, you know, if you want to read it yourself. Um, but it's called "How Solitude and Isolation Can Affect Your Social Skills." And I'll read a little bit out about. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Um, so it says here, Neil Ansel, Ansel became a hermit entirely by accident. Back in the 1980s, he was living in a squat, which is what? What is that? Is that a, is that an apartment? in London with 20 other people. I don't know uh, uh, what a squad is. I, I imagine it's an apartment. Um, could be a house. Then someone made him an offer he couldn't refuse. A cottage in the Welsh mountains with rent of just 100 euro a year. This was a place so wild, the night sky with a continuous carpet of stars, and the neighbors were a pair of ravens who had lived in the same cedar tree for 20 years. Okay. The catch was the scenic views came with extreme isolation. By standards achievable in the UK anyway, he lived on a hill farm inhabited by a single elderly tenant miles from the nearest village. He didn't have a phone, and in the five years he lived there, not a single person walked by the house. Okay. That sounds great. Um, I think I'd love that for a little while. I don't think I could do it very long, but... It's good to get away. Uh, I became so used to being on my own that I recall going to the village shop one day and my voice cracking. As I had asked for something at the counter, he says, I realized I hadn't spoken in two weeks. Not a single word. And that became quite normal for me. By the time he returned to civilization, Ensel had fully adapted to being on his own. And the social world was a bit of a shock. What I found difficult was the amount of talking. I'm not, a, I'm not an antisocial person, but I did struggle with that. Another thing, Ansel, notice was uh, that his identity, okay, the identity had gradually started to slip away. When you're alone, you start to lose your sense of who you are because you don't have an image of yourself reflected in the way that other people react to you. So I think to some extent, that I returned. When I returned, I had to rediscover who I could be in a social setting, he says. Okay, fast forward to 2020, and Ensel's experiences might resonate more widely than they once would have. With lockdown, shielding, and self-isolation, well, self <laughs> many of us have spent much more time in our own company. Um, so they're going to try to relate it to the, you know, the lockdowns. I don't think it's that extreme, at least not in the U.S., um, where I'm from. I don't think it's, I don't think I can compare what I'm doing now to uh, living in a Welsh uh, countryside, you know, uh, for five years uh, without a neighbor walking by. So, kind of extreme there. Um, but I just wanted to read that part to kind of uh, use it as a springboard to what I wanted to talk about. Um, so you, you are what you do every day, okay? Ensel changed, you know, his identity changed because he did not do the same things every day, okay? Well, I mean, it doesn't really get into an article, but I can imagine, you know, with no electricity, um, what are some things that, you know, if you look at your brain, what are some things that you give up moving from, you know, social London, 20 people living in your flat uh, to being by yourself for five years in a cottage in a mountainside. You know, your brain isn't going to remain the same. It's going to ch change and adapt to that new environment. Okay. Uh, so what you do every day matters. Okay. Because your brain um, adapts to um, the demands from the environment. That's the first thing we're going to talk to today. Um, environmental demands. Right. So environmental demands, uh, development of the mind starts with the brain. Okay, so we're not getting into personality. The mind, brain, you know, the 
two different things, right? You got conscious. The brain is more than three pounds of floating flesh in your skull. The mind is more of your conscious self, your personality, that type of thing. This requires interactions of the brain with its physical, intellectual, and social environment. Okay, so physical, intellectual, social. Physical could be like where you live, where you grew up, you grew up on a farm, in a city. Um, Who did you grow up maybe around? Maybe the people in your life? What kind of family structure? Um, intellectual, uh, how stimulating is your environment? Does it make you think? Do you have to explore and discover new things? Um, and then social, you know, social talk to other people um, and this isn't just like developmental as in like as you age you know starting from a baby it, it, it does include that but this also happens as an adult okay um, so you are what you do every day you are what your physical you know environment intellectual environment social environment what does that look like that's who you become okay? if you don't like something in that environment you know, as an adult, you have choices. You can make changes. Um, these demands will cause stress on the individual. Okay? That will lead to the individual to adapt and change to meet them over time and through practice. I'm sure Ansel, you know, had to adapt and change to a lot, you know, to his lifestyle. He, you know, uh, no electricity, so he has to learn how to cook food on an open fire. I don't know if he has to, you know, what else he has to do. It seems like it's more, like, much more survival uh, uh, living out in the mountainside. Um, so I'm sure he had to gain uh, a lot of knowledge about living in that type of environment. And the stuff that he learned from living in London, that slowly, you know, he slowly lost that. Okay, so he gained, he lost. The brain's there to help you adapt to your new environment, okay? Um, uh, let's see here. The environment will automatically cause an individual to repeatedly behave in a manner that manages the demands that causes the individual to become more effective and efficient, okay? So your, your brain is gonna help you adapt. Um, it's gonna help you meet the demands. It's not gonna just let you die, right? It's gonna help you think things through, try try new things, um, you know, try an, try an arrow, help you remember what you did wrong so you can not do that again, what you did right. If you did it right, um, maybe he went fishing, you know, for food. <laughs> um, you know, how did he catch fish? Where did he catch fish? You know, that part of the brain is going to grow. That memory is going to grow. And he's going to remember, oh, that's what I got to do. That's the bait I got to use. You know, I got to be at the lake at this time. You know, you remember all that. And your brain's going to grow. Um, the stuff you remember back in London, he probably got weaker. You know, those... those uh, connections and the brain got weaker and he probably you know maybe not forgot entirely but pushed it back into the uh, unconscious or um, well, maybe he just yeah maybe he just got lost you know I forgot um, about it uh, the human element not discuss this so I'm really want it to be very simple here you know the environment has demands your brain is going to grow change and adapt to meet those demands okay you know, the human element with personality, self-esteem, you know, confidence, you know, all that might affect how you meet demands. Um, I don't want to talk about it right there. No, that's that's going to come later. But we're just talking about, you know, very simple brain environment. Uh, the human brain has many different areas that specialize in managing different stressors. Depending on the environment determines the growth of that area in the brain. And how does the brain grow? Theory of neuroplasticity. I'm sure you heard of it. Uh, there's books written on it. Okay, so I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm giving this topic one slide. I don't know if I'm gonna do it much justice with one slide, but I'm gonna do my best here. Okay, so theory of neuroplasticity explains how the brain makes adjustments to its physiology to to learn and adapt to the environment. This change includes turning on genes that strengthen connections between neurons. Right. So neurons are the, are the cells in your brain, um, and they, they connect. Uh, they have the cell body, and then the axon, and then the dendrites. Dendrites kind of look like a tree branch, like kind of like this. And then you got another neuron right here. They don't touch. There's a little gap, we'll call the synapse, between the two, and they communicate with little tiny chemicals that come out of the, you know, the the uh, dendrites, 
and they go into this dendrite, and then that sends a message down to the axon, the cell body, and it just you know it turns on that gene. Um, but that's how they connect, and that's how they talk to each other, and that's how you form connections in your brain. So when you learn something new, that connection becomes stronger, especially if you repeat it over and over again. And I said here, repetition, strength of connection, and you get better at it. You know, you're not good at things right away. You got to practice. You know, the reason you practice is stronger neurons. You know, depending on what it is. You know, if you're talking about learning a language. Yeah, that's you, you want to practice a, that a lot over and over again, and you know, it's going to be a really strong connection. And there's billions of these connections everywhere in your brain, so it's it's really hard sometimes to wrap your head around it all. But um, that's uh, that's that's how we learn. That's how our brains grow. That's how we retain information, and that's how we um, create ourselves, personality, our identity. Um, it, it all comes from this. When we learn something new. Uh, we uh, create new connections between our neurons. We rewire our brains to adapt to new circumstances. This happens on a daily basis, but it's also something that we can encourage and stimulate or break down. Okay? Breaking down is a little bit harder, and usually it has to come from a therapist um, in order to you know, stop certain cycles of behavior. Okay? Uh, so those the, the strong connections, if you want to stop something, you got to break them down to their like not they're really weak what your mind will do is and i don't know where i heard this but your mind takes the path of least resistance okay so you're always going to use the behaviors or the connections <laughs> i'm going to do this the connections um, that's the strongest you know the brain's always going to use the strongest connections um, so if you're an avoidant type and you avoid most social uh, circumstances your brain's gonna go the path resist uh, path of least resistance and do what you usually do. Okay. Uh, the enormous number number of facts and procedures that we use are organized and reorganized into interlocking frameworks so that you can retrieve a piece of memory along many different pathways. So a lot of different pathways, neurons. They create huge frameworks. Really hard to. I mean, it's kind of something you can visualize, but then you say, "Oh, there's a billion of these things." <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I think I can try, you know, I try to look at that simple. You just, you know, a couple of neurons, but one probably goes to the memory bank, you know. Yeah, one, well, there's probably some in your eyes feeding you information. You got the sensory, um, your senses feeding the brain information. Your brain's telling you what to do. Um, and it's deciding on what to do based on those connections, okay. Every inch of your brain is valuable beachfront property. I put that there because that those, you, you hear, you come across that, oh, we only use 10% of our brain, and that's so ridiculous. We use every part of our brain because it's very valuable. You know, each part of our brain is responsible for some type of behavior, um, and <laughs> we don't use 10% of our brain. We use all of it. If you don't use it, you lose it. So, um, okay, so the next one, environment-brain relationship. Okay, so this is very, and I put this at the bottom, very behavioristic, behavioristic view. Um, don't think about the human element right now, okay? Uh, the environment that surrounds you impacts the way your brain develops through your experience, okay? What you do every day matters. Physical, intellectual, social, okay? And as an adult, you have, you have the ability to change what surrounds you, okay? You can change how stimulating your day is. Okay. Um, do you read? Do you play games? Do you like how intellectually stimulating um, you make it is up to you. you know, as, a, as a child, you don't really have that much choice. Social, um, how much, you know, if you feel like you're lacking social skills or like to be better at social and meeting people, having a conversation with people, you got to practice. You got to wire that brain. Physical uh, environment. Um, so, uh, all these things have an impact, impact on our brain. These things determine our brain growth and how much control do you have. Again, as an adult, you have more, but you have to identify what you want to change, you know, uh, and then make those changes. And you have to do it every day because every day, you know, matters. The environment you create will pressure your brain to adapt and change. 
uh, what you surround yourself um, every what you surround yourself with every day matters. Uh, I think I worded that funny, but you know what I mean. Neuroplasticity helps an individual manage the environment that will help the individual survive by meeting the demands placed on them. Okay, so if if I let's say I got sh I don't know I don't know how this would happen, but what happens if I just if I went from my life now and went to go be a fisherman in China? Okay, you know I'm not going to be the same person. I'm I'm going to slowly turn into a successful fisherman in China. You know I'm going to learn the language. I'm going to learn the you know um, the interpersonal skills. You know what it takes to be successful to live. Um, so I might, you know, it, it, your brain's going to help you do that, okay? Uh, very behavioralistic view. So this is really, really simple stuff. Um, when we throw in the, like, personality, that's when it becomes a little bit um, difficult, I think. And here we go, the personality. Environment, brain, personality relationship, okay? So I, do, I just put the, uh, like, some personality traits up there. So, like, agreeableness, right? This is the big five personality traits. Agreeableness. What type of environment will breed people to be more agreeable? You know, and a, and a, um, a uh, what's, what did I put? Trusting. Trusting is a behavior that agreeable people do. Okay. What causes somebody to be more trusting? You know, what forms those connections, those strong connections? You know, I meet somebody, they ask me to borrow uh, my pen, you know. Ooh, now I'm a trusting person. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Here you go. I'm sure I'll get that back, which I probably won't, right? <laughs> um, but what's the opposite? You know, not distrust, you know? What type of environment breeds that? You know, what type of environment causes people to be more distrustful? Because it's something, there's something there that causes those connections to be strengthened. So every time I'm in a relationship, I put my guard way up because I don't trust that person. They're going to hurt me, Okay. I've been hurt before, right? Uh, I'm not going to be. I'm not going to get. I'm not going to be uh, uh, hurt again. So I'm going to protect myself. Um, openness, openness to new experiences. Again, over your lifetime, you created these connections in your brain, which make you more open. Same with conscientiousness, extroversion, neuroticism. Okay. You don't just develop these when you're born. Um, I think the big five we're trying to organize say these are common in everybody and I think that's pretty much true like you're gonna be agreeable or you're not or you're gonna be somewhere in the middle maybe if I don't know you you know it's gonna take a while for me to trust you you know um, but I, I don't think they're like you don't like let's let's say like like there's a um, what's it called? Like a dimension, you know, like a dimension. You got a little like wave there, um, and you got agreeable on the side underneath it. And then you know you put more, you know, more agreeable this side, and then less agreeable that side. Can you see me on there? I don't know how wide that lens is, but um, so everybody has this agreeableness, and you're not really set up on either side yet. You're not more or less or in the middle. You know, you go through your life and experience things, forming connections. And that's going to put you somewhere unagreeable, okay? And that's going to be part of your personality. Same with openness, conscientiousness. We all have these traits, but we're not really, you know, where we're put on that dimension isn't really there yet until we um, grow and learn and experience life. So, um, so yeah, so your environment, okay, will make you more agreeable or make you less agreeable make you more open conscientious again it's your experience it's what you learn through living um, neurotic you know more worried dark triad traits you know i put those up there i don't know if you you know if you like those or not i, I thought they were kind of interesting Machiavell machiavellianism manipulative and self-interested what type of environment would, would cause somebody who, you know, we can all be manipulative. And again, we could put the dimension up with manipulative Machiavellianism underneath it. Where do you fall on that dimension? Are you less? Are you more? Are you in the middle? You know, it depends on, on what you experience, how you grew up. Um, but these, these personality traits, 
you know, you may be more agreeable, and then something might happen. Well, then you're, you know, you're 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 less agreeable. You know, it's your personality is very fluid. You know, some I've heard it's been some people say it's very static. I don't think it's static. I think it's static because it's hard to change because it's. Well, we'll talk about that later. But it's like once it's ingrained, once it has a strong connection in your brain, it's very hard to change. Okay. Um, so those are some personality uh, examples. Uh, psychopathy. You know what causes somebody to be more callous. You know? I read a book called Murderous Minds. Really good. You should check it out if you're into uh, like forensic psych. Uh, it was written by somebody who has psychopathy, and he, he made the case that you're born that way. So uh, I thought that was uh, interesting. Um, let's see. Let's see. Then which neural pathway strength? And kind of talked about that. You know, it depends on your experience. What are the environmental circumstances that cause each personality trait? Um, again, you have to look back and see. I am much more, I mean, personally, much more introverted, I'm quiet, shy. Um, when I was a child, okay. I don't know why. I had to probably more explore that more. Why I'm more introverted, um, but now I think I'm much more leaning extrovert. Just because I think, you know, I think I grew up and I started working retail and I started talking to people and I started, you know, con you know, uh, c conversing and forming those connections and knowing how to form, um, you know, conversations and relate to people and, and all that. You know, it takes practice. Um, and I think I've... Well, you know what? Maybe I'm much more introverted. I don't know. I don't think you can really change that through social connection that I'm thinking about. Just because introverted... Introverts can can still socialize. We're not antisocial. We just prefer to be by ourselves sometimes. We need that time to kind of... Um, what's... How do they term it? En energize? Um... We need that time to be alone. You know, that's we, we like we, we get our energy from being alone. I, f I forget how they worded that, but but extroverts they they get their energy from talking to people, and being around people, and stuff like that. So, um, so let's know, in extroversion, I feel like um, being more sociable. You you can definitely practice that um, if you want to be extrovert. You know, again, how do you Learn what you need to learn to become more extroverted. Um, the development of the mind starts with the brain, uh, environment, relationship, and results in your individual identity. Okay, let me read that again. The development of the mind, which is your conscious self, right? Memories, who you are, how you would describe yourself in like an interview. With the brain, environment, relationship, and results in your individual identity. Okay, so that your environment is going to put stress on your brain. Your brain is going to grow to meet those demands, and through that growth, um, your personality will come out. Okay. Environment, brain, personality, society relationship. Okay, how you interact with society will determine how it interacts with you. No matter your development and brain pathways, you'll create a world that maintains and strengthens you. So if you are, um, how do I go back? Ah, there it is. So if you are narcissistic, you lean very heavily on narcissism. Okay. Um, what type of world does that create for you? you know, what type of relationships do you get in? How's your work? Are you in jail? Um, so, and, and it's it's going to strengthen that narcissism. It's going to maintain it. Um, you set up a world that strengthens a two-way street. Worried. You know, if you're a more worried person, okay, I mean, that's, um, <laughs> the world already kind of strengthens worry, right? Because in a world of possibilities, you know, your what-ifs constantly worrying um, about everything. It's going to strengthen that. It's a two-way street. Physical, social, and internal, and intellectual environment, um, social, society will support your traits and will not change them, okay? Only you can change them. Unless you pick up and move to a completely different environment like Encel did, uh, you're not going to change. You're, the society you set up for yourself is going to support you. Okay? If you're a closet um, or not they call it, uh, a hermit, you know, you're, society will support that. They're, 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 you're going to let in society whatever you feel is, is comfortable for you. 
Um, this will lead to nothing to change and a daily cycle that becomes your world. When something does come along that is not supportive of your personality, it will be avoided or cast out of your world. And examples, preferences. Okay, your preference, okay, look at the personality traits. Um, let's see, conscientiousness. You have a preference on where you work, who you're around, who you marry. If you're a well-organized person, uh, I'm sure you're probably going to want something, uh, you know, a job that you can be, you know, that's well-organized. Okay. So you're setting up the world, and if you do choose a job that's well-organized, well, it's going to feed your well-organized personality, and you two and two go together great. Okay. Well, what happens if you're not organized? Maybe you're a mess. You know, what are you going to do? You know, um, how do you become more war well organized? Uh, well, you have to look at the connection of what made you a mess. Um, and you have to think about the, the behaviors that are related to being a mess, and you have to change those and start practicing organization. Where do I start? Take the tiny steps you know, to uh, reach your goal of being more well organized. And through those tiny steps, you know, through therapy, um, you will strengthen connections in your brain on how to be well organized. Okay? And being a well organized person changes the world around you because you're going to start choosing people to hang out with that are more organized, where your work is more organized, you're probably be more successful, and you're probably going to marry or be involved with people that are organized. Okay. Um, values. Uh, the values you choose um, to live by. Uh, go with your personality, how you perceive things, again, how you perceive things, that you know, the environment, and how it grew the brain and created your personality, um, determines how you perceive events uh, and habits, developing habits. Brain, brain fluidity or plasticity, personality, neural pathways, strength, weaknesses are not per permanent. Pathways can break down and new ones can form. You are what you do every day, okay? So if you want to change yourself, you have to change what you do every day, okay? Just like Ansel did. Um, I think that was a good example of how your brain will change to meet the demands um, uh, of the environment, okay? So that was that. Um, Please uh, subscribe. Please like this video. I appreciate it if you do. Um, now this is kind of a this is a video that I'm kind of building my church. I guess it's the rock I'm building my church off of. Uh, so because it, it 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 kind of touches a lot of things, and I think I can refer to this video uh, a lot uh, in what I want to do with the uh, with my YouTube channel. So um, kind of took me a while to make. But I felt like it was worth it. It was it was definitely needed. I needed something to I feel like launch my. I feel like I was doing a lot of random stuff, but I feel like I could build on this video. So pretty excited. Uh, so please like and subscribe, and I uh, yeah and yeah check out my future videos. So you have a good night. Thank you for stopping by. Uh, bye.